Before we get into today's video, I do want to let you guys know that this video is for entertainment purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comment section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody anywhere. Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance in hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, y'all already know, y'all are my babies. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. So in today's video, we are going to be talking about Joel Guy Jr. Have you heard about this? Have you heard about this feller right here? If you haven't, I really do wonder why. I had not heard about this guy until y'all started sending him to me. DMs, emails, all of that stuff, they started coming in a few months ago and I just was not ready to tackle this case at that time. I looked into it and I was like, ugh. But now I'm like, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to do this. Before we get into it though, I do want to give you guys a little bit of a disclaimer that there will be quite some gory details in this video. So if you're squeamish about those types of things, or if you just can't listen, then I understand. But this one is a real, real doozy, okay? So let's just start at the beginning. Joel Guy Jr. is a story or a case of what I would consider every mother or father's or grandparent or any parent's worst nightmare. You spend your time devoted to your child, you know, like as, as a mom, like we find out we're pregnant and we're like super excited, but we're also nervous. You know, every time you go to the doctor and you're pregnant and you're, you're just nervous, you want to make sure your baby is healthy and your baby's okay. And then you go through the whole process and you deliver, you bring this baby into the world and then you feed your child, you teach your child how to walk and talk and you just give your child everything you can and all of the love in the world that you can give them. And then they turn around when they're older and then they kill you. Like, I, I just, I cannot imagine a worse way to leave this earth. So Joel Guy Jr., who was born in March of 1988, he had three older sisters. Now they were his stepsisters. His father, Joel Guy Sr., who was 61 years old, as well as his mother, Lisa Guy, she was 55 years old. They married, at this time, they were married for 31 years. And Joel Jr.'s father had three other girls by his first marriage. So they were all very, very close, though. I mean, the three older girls was very close with their dad. They would go there to see their dad and their stepmom for the summers, and they would go there any other chance that they could get. They were raised with from a single mom. But when the girls came there, they felt like they had the real family environment with, with Joel Sr. and then Lisa, which was their stepmom. The girls would later testify in court that their stepmom was like, was basically like the mom on television. Like she always had food in her cupboards and she cooked dinner every night and they could see that she really, really, really loved their father and loved them and loved their little brother, Joel. And I so wanted to be this woman that my first engagement ring was her exact engagement ring. And I wanted to be the mom she was. I wanted to, she would sit in her little brown, very brown shirt. She had a really high arch in her foot and just with her cup. I wanted to even, at certain points in my life, I walked around with a cup that had like the little square um, placement under it um, because I wanted to be her. I wanted to be the mom that she was. They just loved being there. They could not say enough wonderful things about their parents. Joel Jr., who was the only child by the two of them together, he graduated from Louisiana. It was a boarding school. It was a school of math, arts, and science. Now, he went there in 10th grade, and he lived there. And I looked up the tuition for the school, and it seemed like pretty affordable. It was like $1,500 for the whole entire year. 
just that was for the boarding fee. You had to have really good grades to get into this school and he applied to go to the school and he was accepted. So he stayed there for his last two years and then he went off to college. He ended up going to a couple different colleges, but he landed at LSU and it is said that he wanted to be a plastic surgeon. Now, Joel was described as a recluse. He did not really come out of his bedroom. As a matter of fact, his three sisters would later testify that they didn't even really know their brother at all. He never came out of his room like to hang out with them or be part of the family. Even as the, goal, the girls got older and they would come and visit their parents all the time. They would come, you know, for the holidays and they would bring their kids and their kids called them Mama and Papa and they were just all so close. They were all in a group text together and they would all chat except for Joel Jr. He was the only one who just was not involved and if he was around, he barely spoke to anybody and he just seemed like he did not want to have a relationship with anybody. Everybody just kind of thought he was socially awkward though and they didn't really press him, but yet everybody else again was super close. Joel Jr. lived on his own for about 10 years. Now, when I say he lived on his own, he never had a job. Never, ever, ever had a paying job. He was 28 years old when all of this stuff we're going to talk about, you know, ended up happening. And he was still in college up until like a year or a year before. He spent nine years in college and never, ever got a degree or graduated. People that were roommates with him would later testify that he spent a lot of time just sitting on his computer watching YouTube or using the internet and that he didn't really even want to hang out with his friends. His tuition and his apartment while he was away at college for nine years was all paid for by his parents. As a matter of fact, his mother actually retired from one job and she went and got another job just so she could pay for his apartment and his schooling and his spending money, his gas, his food and everything. And they tried to, over the years, get him to be more independent and get his own job. Like, hello, like you're 25 at this point. Can you help a sister out here or you're 26 or whatever and all the way up until he was 28 and he just never did get a job and he just continued to let his mother work while he sat around. Now in 2015 he quit going to LSU but he was still living on his own in his apartment that his mother who was 55 years old and retired from another job was working to pay his bills. Now in 2016, his parents were planning on telling him that he needed to get out and stand on his own two feet. See, his father, who was again 61 years old, was getting ready to retire from his job. He was so excited. His mother, you know, she decided that she wanted to be retired too. She's 55, retired from her other job. She's ready to stop working and they were going to sell their house. They had a big, big, beautiful home. They put their house up for sale on the market and they were going to move back home to the town where Joel's senior sister was and where their parents' old house was, Joel's and his sister's parents' old house was. And when his dad died, his dad left his home, the family home, in his sister's name, and Joel ended up buying the house from his sister, and him and his wife, Lisa, were going to sell their big home, buy the family home, move back home and retire. And they had their finances completely worked out. One of his daughters would later testify in court that as far as their finances go with like their retirement, they had every penny and every dollar mapped out, even down to their cigarette money and their beer money for the week. So, so they were literally planning on taking them to retire, good, good for them, <laughs> and their dog moving back home and sitting around drinking beer smoking their cigarettes, and just enjoying the rest of their life together. Joel Sr. had been wanting to cut off Joel Jr. for a while now. I mean, he was like, come on, he's a grown man, but this was her only baby, you know, boy, and her, her actual only biological child. As a matter of fact, at their home, she still had his bedroom exactly the way it was when he moved out. I mean, down to toys, honey, beanie babies, little socks, little all, all the little tinker toys and stuff. She kept it like a memorabilia room of her son and didn't even want to get rid of anything. And so she really wanted to do anything she could for her baby boy. But at this point, if they were going to retire, it was time. He was going to have to stand on his own two feet and get a job. 
In November of 2016, right around Thanksgiving time, the plan was to have all of their family time with their kids and stuff. The kids always came home for the holidays. The grandkids would be running around. They would all stand in the garage and just talk and tell stories and eat good food. And then they'd go to the back porch on the patio and they talk and tell stories and laugh and, and banter and joke with each other and they would eat good food. And typically Joel, if he was there, he would just stay in his room. But this year things were a little different because they knew that they were going to really have to make Joel understand that he's going to have to stand on his own two feet this time. But also they had put their house up for sale and it did sell. So when the house sold, they had to be out by December 13th. So less than a month, like they had to get their stuff, get out. So they were packing up their stuff and they started slowly moving it to the other house that they had purchased. And they were going to plan on doing Christmas this year instead of at the house they were living living in currently that they were selling, but at the new house. And during Christmas, the plan for Joel Sr. and Lisa was to tell Joel Jr. then, okay, this is it. Okay, you got to stand on your own two feet. It's, a, it, it's a, the, the support is over. You're 28. You got to do it on your own. Surprisingly, though, for Thanksgiving, Joel showed up for Thanksgiving and none of the family was actually expecting him to show up. He typically didn't show up for Thanksgiving. He didn't show up until Christmas and he was living in Baton Rouge because he was going to LSU up until the year before. And so it was like a nine hour drive, honey. He had to drive a long ways, but yet, you know, now they have all their kids there. So they were excited. They even took this picture right here, Joel Jr., Joel Sr. and Lisa in this photo on Thanksgiving Day. Something was different about this Thanksgiving though. One of the sisters, Michelle, would testify in court that Joel was acting really strange. And by acting strange, he was actually out of the room talking to people. He was in a great mood. He was very outgoing and chatty and they had never, I'm talking about never, and they had been in his life since he was born, okay? Ever seen him be like that. When one of the sisters went out to her car to get something, she noticed in the back seat of Joel's car was like these two big blue Rubbermaid bins. She didn't think too much of it, but she was like, okay, you know, whatever that, whatever that's for. And she went back into hanging out with everybody. Another strange thing that Joel did on this day was he took his three nephews upstairs to his bedroom. Remember how I told you that her mom kept, their mom kept all the stuff and started giving his nephews like his beanie babies and bins and bins of toys. And Michelle, his older stepsister, was grateful, but she was kind of confused by this because she didn't even think he knew her kids' names. Like he had never talked to her children before. Like not an exaggeration. He never came out and talked to them and hung out with them. During court, the aunts, the uncles, like other family members testified. It said none of them had a relationship with Joel Jr. He was very reclusive and just did not want to have a relationship with anybody in the family. And this man was 28 years old. It's not like he was a 12-year-old boy, okay? He was 28. One of the sisters would also testify that he was acting strange. She was upstairs doing some laundry because like her dryer had broke. So she brought her laundry with her to her parents' house. And every time she turned around when she was upstairs, she felt like Joel was right behind her. And it was just weird. She kept looking behind her like, why is he behind me? You know, typically he's just in the room by himself. So there was some little things that were off on that day, but not enough for anybody to go, okay, something wild is about to happen. This was all on the 23rd. They celebrated Thanksgiving early and together and all of the ladies and their children left, but Joel ended up staying. He was gonna stay a long weekend with his parents at this point because it was a nine hour drive. And so the next day, Joel Sr. and Joel Jr. drove to the new house and Joel Sr. was showing his son the new house and they took their boat over there, Joel, Joel Sr.'s boat over there so they could park it. And they had been cleaning up the new house and I can just imagine what that ride in the truck was about. I mean, they were chatting, they were probably talking, like he was probably asking him how school was. You know, whatever, just some father-son time, right? However, on November 26th is the day that everything would change. Joel Jr.'s mother, Lisa, went to Walmart and PetSmart. While she was at Walmart and PetSmart, I'm assuming this part of what happened because of the evidence Upstairs on the second floor, they had like this like little workout room where they had what looked like a, a ski thing. You know, you pull that for a workout, like a rowing machine, that's it. And there was a treadmill and there was some little weights and stuff up there. 
I'm assuming the way that I have seen this is the father, Joel Sr., was up there probably on the treadmill or on the, on the rowing machine, and Joel Jr. attacked him from behind and started to stab him, okay? He stabbed his father, from what they could tell, like 40 times. When you look at the crime scene photos, and I will leave links of videos and resources and all of that down below if you guys want to go and check them out. There was blood all over the walls, splattered all over the floor, and the rowing machine was turned over onto the floor. There was ripped and torn blinds, and after Joel stabbed his father 40 times in that room, he cut his hands off. Yes, cut his hands off and left them laying there next to the rowing machine. If you see this picture right here, you see the blurred out spot. That is where his hands were. The next thing Joel did, he took the family dog. They had a dog that they treated like, like a kid. It, th their daughters testified that they would put little ice chips in the dog's water and the dog ate like the best food and slept in the bed with them and did everything with them. I mean, the dog was their child, but he locked the dog into the laundry room and then he waited for his mother to get back. Now, his mother, while she was at Walmart, just not thinking a thing, just bringing her groceries, probably sitting there thinking about her son at home with her husband and how things were gonna be so much better once they retire and how they just had a wonderful Thanksgiving and how she got to spend the best time with her grandkids. Lisa left Walmart at 12.15 that afternoon and got home around 12.30. When she got inside, she was bringing in groceries and what I can tell from this picture right here because there's quite a bit of grocery bags and you see there's a couple different like cases of beer, not something that she would probably, probably be able to carry all at one time. So I'm assuming she brought in two different loads of groceries and then she was lured upstairs. Now, the way the groceries are dropped, it looks like somebody upstairs was yelling at her, probably saying, oh my gosh, something happened to dad or mom, get up here. You know, whatever it was to make her drop the groceries right then and run upstairs. And when she ran upstairs past the little doggy gate, that is where she was attacked by her precious baby boy. It is said that she was stabbed over 30 times by her son, you guys. There, is a pile, there was a pile of blood on the floor right there, like he just got her right when she was coming up the stairs. Now this is when the case just goes to a whole nother level. Joel Jr. then starts to dismember his parents' bodies. Joel Jr. cuts his mom's legs off, but starting at the kneecaps down, he removed both of her arms from the shoulder blade, the whole entire arm, and he cut off her head. His father, you know he had already removed his hands. He cut off his legs from the hips, his arms from the shoulder blade, and then the hands were removed. Joel Jr. takes his mother's head and puts it in a giant cooking pot with whatever kind of liquid that was in there and puts it on the stove downstairs and turns the heat on and starts cooking his mother's head. Then he takes those big blue bins that I was telling you guys about and takes them into one area of the house, there's two of them, and puts most of the remains of it, like his, definitely his parents' torsos, in these big blue bins and pours tons of chemicals. And I mean, he had all kinds of chemicals. He had bleach, he had sewer cleaner, he had Drano, he had alcohol, he had peroxide, he had all kinds of different chemicals. And he poured them over their torsos and their bodies. At this point, Joel was actually himself bleeding pretty bad because his dad really put up a fight. I don't know if his mom put up a fight or not, and it's just heartbreaking to think about if she did or didn't, but his dad definitely put up a fight and he had cuts all over his hands. And when doing these cases, I've seen a lot of times that like when there's a stabbing, typically, the person that does the stabbing will get injured as well. And Joel got injured. He had stabs all over his hands, as you guys can see right here. But the main cut was this one on his thumb here. It was super duper deep, almost to the point that it almost severed his thumb. So Joel left the house at 3.30 and went to the same Walmart that his mom was just at to get first aid supplies. So you guys got to think, she got home at 12.30. So by 12.30 to 3.30, he had already done all of that stuff and headed to Walmart. And you guys, and I know this is really gruesome, but I warned you guys in the beginning, that's not easy to do, okay? Cutting off, cutting through bone, that is 
like, not that I've ever done it, and you know what I mean, but that is not easy to do. He managed to do all of that and then get to Walmart at 3.30 to buy his first aid supplies. Anyways, he was seen on the security camera there, and that's how they knew what he was there and what he was buying. He spent the night in that house with that whole entire scene. And the next day on the 27th, he decided that he was going to leave. And I'm assuming that he left because of his finger, that he drove back home and went to the Louisiana clinic. But before he left, he left that pot cooking, by the way, on the stove on low heat. He turned the heater up in the house to like 90 or 95 degrees. So the dog is locked upstairs in the bathroom. The parents' torsos and most of their human remains are in those two big blue bins. The hands are still on the floor. And it is a, a brutal crime scene everywhere in that house. And he drives nine hours back home to Baton Rouge so he can go get his finger treated. The next day, on November 28th, Lisa did not show up for work. Now, this was absolutely out of character for her. As a matter of fact, she had a meeting that day that she planned. Her boss, Jennifer, started calling her, and after she called her and called her and called her and called her and nobody answered, she knew something was not right. This is not Lisa or how she acts or anything. So she called 911 and asked for the police to go do a welfare check on her. And actually around this time, I believe was one of his daughter's birthdays and Joel Sr.'s daughter's birthdays. And Joel Sr. didn't call her his daughter on her birthday. And she knew something was up with that because her dad always called. I mean, they talked almost every single day anyways, because they had that group chat and they just all, they, they all chatted together. So when the cops showed up to Joel Sr. and Lisa's house, they showed up, they knocked on the door, they smelt like a weird chemical smell. They looked around, they talked to the neighbors, they couldn't get in, they could not get in and they were getting ready to leave. Now, Jennifer at this time, the boss, she did not know that the cops had already went out there. So she called back again to the police and asked for them to go out there. And when she did, the cops went back out there. And this time they really started looking a little bit closely. They went to the door and they could almost feel the heat like coming off of the door. It was like they could tell it was like hot in there. They looked through the window and they saw the groceries laying on the floor right there in the foyer. And when they saw the groceries, they realized there was like actual pear perishable groceries laying there. There was ice cream, there was milk, there was sausage. Things that you wouldn't just leave on the floor and go somewhere else. Yeah, maybe you might come in and leave, you know, some pasta noodles or some bread and then go run an errand, but you're not gonna leave your ice cream and your milk and your sausage and stuff just laying on there on the floor, eggs, all that, and that's what they saw. So they started getting suspicious. They went around to the backyard, they hopped the fence to get into the backyard and they realized that the handle on the back door was missing. They thought that that was weird, but they still just did not know what to do. They went back to the neighbors, asked the neighbors if they had a key. They didn't. And then they noticed in the front yard that there was a for sale sign. So they called the realtor and asked the realtor if they had a key. The realtor said, no, the house was already sold. We don't have a key, but is there any cars in the garage? And they were like, the cops was like, yes, there's two cars in the garage. So both of their vehicles were still there. So the realtor said, look in the car to see if you can find a garage door opener. So the cop said, thank you, got off the phone with the realtor, went over to the car, found the garage door opener and opened the garage. When they opened the garage and they went in the garage to go into the house, as soon as they opened the door, they were blasted with heat and the smell of chemicals. And they just, they were like, what? The cops would later testify that the smell along with the heat made his hairs stand up all over his body. Like he was not prepared for that. He walked in the door and he started calling out, you know, like, hello, is anybody here? Mr. and Mrs. Guy, are you okay? Hello, police, we're coming in to check. They don't hear anything back. He starts walking through the kitchen. He sees a pot on the stove. He tells his partner, you know, that there's heat coming off of that. So that's obviously cooking. He walks past the pot. He sees the groceries laying on the floor. They're yelling out, hello, hello, hello. At this point, they see the thermostat and it says 90 degrees. So they're like, you know, okay, all this is on the body cam footage and you can find all of this and I'll leave it linked down below as well. They can hear a dog crying upstairs and this dog cry is not a regular dog cry. It's not like a whining. This is like a a, a well, whelping, like a, and you can tell this dog is stuck somewhere. So they start to walk up the stairs. And when they get up the stairs, 
and they see the dog gate, they see the blood. They see there's like chemicals on the floor and clothing on the floor. The cops, they have their guns drawn and they're calling out still. They're calling out. And when one of the cops walks up the hallway and looks into the room and sees into the room of the exercise, he says, I had absolutely no idea what I was walking into. He realizes that they're, they're actual human hands. And that's when they, he goes back downstairs, he calls for backup. When backup gets there and they get ready to really search the house, you guys, little things that they saw was like feces on the floor in the living room, which, I mean, did Joel poo in their living room floor? I mean, I, I don't know, feces on the floor in the living room. Wallets spread out on the table on the dining room. Hold that thought. Wallets. When they got upstairs, I mean, blood everywhere. Blood splattered everywhere. When they walked into that room with those two big blue bins, you guys. The, uh, uh, body parts liquefying. Liquefying. I'll never get those smells out of my head or my dreams. The smell, the sight. The cops said that they will never get the smell and the sight of that out of their dreams. I mean, they're traumatized. They called what they saw in those blue bins a diabolical stew of human remains. The only thing I saw were two tubs with what appeared to be uh, uh, body parts liquefying. liquefying. It was, um, it was determined that there was a, a head uh, a severed head in the pot. Joel had put so many chemicals into those those tubs that it was breaking down the skin and the flesh and the body parts and it was becoming a thick human stew. You can only imagine what the cops thought when they walked to the stove and opened up that pot and saw Lisa Guy's head in there. The cop would later testify that the hair was still attached even though the head had been boiling for days. They said that it was the most horrific thing that they had ever seen in their lives, in their careers as police officers and detectives. When searching the house, they found all kinds of items, you know, like the bleach. They found knives that had blood on it. The blood had the blood of the parents as well as Joel's on it. They did find the dog that was in the locked into the laundry room and he was transported for medical treatment and then later given to a family member. So the dog was okay, but he had been in that room for days with the heat and it ended up being, I think, 95 degrees on the second story. And the dog was up there with no water, no food, no nothing, all alone without his parents, probably heard everything that was going on with his parents and the poor dog had been through it too. When they searched, they found something super interesting and it was a backpack. It was a backpack that was left in the room of where Joel was staying. In that backpack was a, a, a book about some kind of directions for something and then there was some other paperwork in there, but there was also a book with a five-paged plan. A five-paged plan on how to kill somebody, dismember somebody, and how to collect the insurance money from their parents. Oh yeah, and it was in grave detail, you guys, listed out. Minimize things I touch throughout the visit. Wear gloves and socks to prevent fingerprints and footprints. Drop something down the garbage disposal to break it. Get him on the ground, fixing it. Kill him with the knife. Clean up the mess from him before she gets home. Kill her with a knife. Take the dog with you. Place her in the shower. Turn on hot water and point at her to get rid of forensics. Remove her clothes and take them with me for disposal. Place him in a plastic bin and use it to get him into the upstairs bathroom. Cut off his arm and plant his flesh under her fingernails. Place her hand with his DNA so that his DNA is not washed away by shower. Use sodium hydrate to destroy his soft tissue and, and soften bones for transport. So as you guys can see, and I'm not reading all of it, I mean, he had it planned out 
what he was going to do. Now, there's a lot of like different theories on why he didn't finish his plan. I think it's because he got injured and he got cut. He probably couldn't mess with all those chemicals with an open wound and a, and a thumb that's about to fall off. You know, like, I don't know if you guys have ever cut your finger, but even the littlest cut, anytime you move it or do anything, it hurts. And I mean, it aches. And when you've got cuts all over you and you're trying to do a big job like he was doing, like, un believable unbelievable but get this remember how i told you the wallets were strode out on the table before he left he took his mother's credit cards he paid like ten thousand dollars on his rent for to like pay his rent up i think that they did uh reject the ten thousand dollar payment but he tried he tried to pay up some of his bills he tried to give himself a hundred dollar spending money i mean like and to think too that he spent the night in that house with his parents in there like <sighs> In this notebook, you guys, he talks about how he had to kill his father because if he just killed his mom, then he his fa he would have to split life insurance money that she had with her company with her his father and that like, you know, he could get the house and all of this and it just makes me wonder like you you had three sisters too. You didn't think that maybe they would be getting anything like I don't know, but who does something like this? Like to your parents, the the woman the father too, but like the woman who literally in her 50s went back to work. So you could sit on your butt and watch YouTube all day long in your room. Like, ugh, like it's just beyond, beyond comprehension. So the cops, obviously they saw the book. They didn't know exactly who it belonged to, you know, with the plan and the insurance and all that. I mean, they had an idea that it was somebody that obviously probably knew them the way it would. I mean, the, who... May, does a crime, writes it all down, and then leaves the plan at the crime scene. More on that later. So now they have to figure out, they know who these people are. They know whose house it is, but they can't actually identify the bodies because the bodies, the most of their bodies, have turned into this mush in these Tupperware containers. So they get a hold of Michelle, one of Joel Sr.'s daughters, and the police ask her to meet them somewhere at this public place. When they meet her, they start asking her questions about her parents, and they say, listen, we think that your parents may be dead, but we cannot identify the bodies right now. And she's like crying and upset, and she's like, well, take me to the bodies. She's like, I can identify them. And he was like, no, you, you don't understand. They're not really identifiable. And she's like... But no, you don't understand. Like, they have 80s haircuts. They have 80s style. Like, there's no way I can't identify my parents' bodies. But what she didn't know is they she really couldn't identify their bodies. Nobody could identify their bodies at that point. When the cops were talking to her, they wanted to know who all was there for that weekend. And she told them, Joel. So, they started investigating him. And when they did... They looked in Baton Rouge and started looking at like his history and stuff. He started buying items for this, for this whole, like these chemicals and these knives and these different like items back on November 7th. So he had been planning this for a long time. He didn't actually carry it out until November 26th, but he started collecting his items on November 7th which is what they have on camera from security cameras from like an Ace Hardware and Walmart and stuff, and probably buying it with his mother's money that she is working for. <sighs> Joel was obviously arrested and charged with two counts of murder and then different counts of, you know, abuse of a corpse. He had seven charges altogether, and it took him four years to get to trial. The reason why it took him four years to get to trial is because Joel kept like pulling all these different stunts. First, he tried to say that the police department could not search that house. They did not have permi permission to search the house because if his parents were technically dead, then that means that that was his house and he didn't give them permission. And you guys, this man up in jail literally tried to still get his portion of the life insurance money because his parents were dead. His sisters and them had to get the, what's it called, the, the Slayers Act or something like that where it's if you actually kill somebody, you cannot benefit from their death. But the audacity, the audacity that he is literally up in jail trying to get some money. <sighs> the trial, the whole trial only took four days. That's it, four days. 
I, I feel so bad for the defense team because they had no case, but he obviously wanted to take it to trial anyways. And so if he wants to take it to trial and say that he's innocent, then he has to actually get a trial. And then if you guys watch the trial and I watched the whole thing, it's here on YouTube. Anytime the prosecutors brought up a witness and there was 27 witnesses and 700 pieces of evidence, 700 pieces of evidence. When they would bring up a witness, the prosecution, which would be different family members or the cops that were on the scene or whoever it was, they would spend all of their time asking the questions and then the defense attorney would get up there and be like, so um, how long have you known Joel? Uh, my whole life. And have you ever seen him be aggressive? No. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. Like, that's all they had. They, that's, that's it. Like, it, it, you could tell they're literally just doing their job. They had no case. So four days he was in trial, the jury deliberated for three hours, and there has to be a minimum, because I know that it didn't take them that long to decide, and they came out and they found him guilty. During the whole entire trial, though, he was so emotionless, like, he sat there and had to look at the pictures, you know, they were showing evidence, pictures that they didn't show us, but they showed them in court, and his whole, their whole, the parents' family was in there, some of the grandkids were in there, and like, I'm not judging them because I don't know what I would do in that situation, but I know right just instant thought, like no way I would have my babies in there, but you know, you, you never know their situation and why they had them in there, but I'm thinking, ugh. So they're in there looking at actual photos, okay? This is going to get gruesome. I'm going to explain this to you. The torso of their grandmother, okay, literally, you're thinking you have a body that has no arms and shoulders, no head on it, just the chest, the back, and part of the, le like, they are looking at actual photos of this up there, okay, what was left of it. The skin on the back, a lot of the skin on the back remained, but all the skin on the front, gone, gone. The father, the grandfather, his head was still attached, but completely cut off here and cut off of his, his legs all the way up to like where his hips were. And then their grandmother's head that had been cooking in a pot for days. And Joel sits there in court and just, just looks at it, drinks his water, sloshes it around his mouth, completely unbothered. Like the only time I saw him show emotion in the whole entire court was when his roommate come to testify. Now let's talk about his roommate. His roommate was a young man and he said he had been best friends with Joel Jr. for 10 years, okay? But now they were roommates. They played a recording of a phone call that Joel made to him while he was in jail. You know, all the calls are recorded. Now in this call, it definitely sounds like they were more than roommates. It sounds like they were in a relationship. I don't know. That could just be the way Joel and him communicate. But in it, he was saying things like, you need to move on in your life without me. I want you to be happy. I'm sorry that I, you know, that this happened, but I need you to be, go and be happy and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I paid the rent up or that was the last thing she did or, or whatever he was saying. But like, these were not conversations that I would think that, you know, you would have with your, but like, go and be happy. Like, I want you to live your life and be happy. I don't have a life anymore. So you go live yours. So it seemed like they had a little thing going on. And if they did, you know, whatever. But it, it's just, you know, seemed like that could have possibly not just been his roommate. That maybe that was his boyfriend. When the judge sentenced him to life. Now, he actually asked for, Joel said, if I get found guilty, will you please give me the death penalty? But the judge didn't. And I think the family was pretty happy about that. They, I think that they wanted him to spend the rest of their life in prison. I don't know. I, that's what I'm thinking, though. The judge said that this was obviously the most gruesome case he had ever seen in 25 years and that he hoped that he'd never seen, sees anything like it. And he actually talked about the fact that Joel was just emotionless and because his sisters got up there, they testified, they cried. They lost their dad and, you know, a woman that they considered a, a mother to them. It was their stepmom. She had been in their life for 31 years. I mean, they, their one, his one daughters who were twins, they were three years old when she came into the picture. So they did not have any memories without Lisa. I mean, this was their parent. And Joel showed no remorse. And when they got up there and said the closing like remarks and then the victim impact statements. 
I mourn terribly for my dad, I do. But I grieve and rage for Lisa. I rage for her from the mother's point of view. I cry for her because I wonder if when she realized the love of her life, the only son she had, the child that she gave her entire life to was about to murder her, I wonder if at that moment when her heart was broken, did she even fight? I cried so much listening to this. You guys, like, I, the family is just so broken. I mean, you can only imagine. You just can't, you know, it's so, so devastating. But the judge said, Joel thinks he is so smart. He thinks he's a lot smarter than he is. And it was interesting to hear the judge say that. And it was true. He did. And so he sentenced Joel Jr. to multiple life sentences and a few more years for the other charges that were not the murder charges. And I think that he's available for parole in 150 years or something like that, I think. I, I think it's going to be very interesting to know what kind of a prison time he's really serving, especially with the kind of person that he is, and he will have no money. Doesn't seem to me that any of his family members are going to be sticking by his side, so it's not going to be a good time for him. But at least he won't have to go and get a real job, and somebody else will be paying his bills, I guess. Okay, was that inappropriate? Sorry. Some final thoughts here, and I know this video is long, but there's just so much to say, and really I feel like I cut it short. <laughs> Uh, as a mother, okay, father's out there too, but as a mother, like, can you imagine a worst way? You know what I mean? Like, you're, I'm a boy mom too. Like, my baby boy, you know, like, that, I mean, it's just heartbreaking, devastating. I just can't, I cannot even envision what she thought in her last few minutes. But I grieve and rage for Lisa. I rage for her from the mother's point of view. I cry for her because I wonder if when she realized the love of her life, the only son she had, the child that she gave her entire life to was about to murder her. I wonder if at that moment when her heart was broken, did she even fight? That got me. That got me. Like, did she even put up a fight when she saw that the love of her life was the one attacking her? Like, do you, do you even fight back when it's your, your baby? Another thing, there's something obviously off with this guy, okay? I don't know if he has some sort of personality disorder or if he is on any kind of spectrum or anything like that, but there was obviously something off about him. Everybody said he was socially awkward. Now, I want to bring up this point because... People, if you have a child that is socially awkward, now I'm not saying the parents did anything wrong. I don't know them and, and it doesn't matter what they did. They did not deserve this. So I'm not saying that because of them. I'm just, I always try to find like a teachable moment in every video. I think sometimes as parents, we can put so much emphasis on like smarts, right? Brains. But if you've watched any of my videos, I've told you guys, there are tons of smart people in prison, Okay. Prison is full of smart people, okay? Don't just think, okay, my kid is smart, that's it. You know, that's it, they're a smart kid. Social skills are very important. If you can help your child be social, you should. And I think you should try. Like, for whatever reason, this kid stayed isolated and to himself and, you know, whatever. And the parents were okay with that. Maybe they just thought, oh, that's just Joel. But I think it's important that we try to involve our kids. I mean, obviously don't push so much on them that you overwhelm them, right? So I don't know, you guys. What do y'all think? Have y'all heard about this? How wild is this? How devastating? How... What do you think is going to happen to Joel in prison? Hmm? Like, I don't know. Well, I mean, I think I know. I have some ideas, but I'm not going to say them. So, all right, you guys. Thank you guys so, so much for watching this video. You know you can stay and watch another one. We've got plenty of other ones. Stay and watch another one. As always, my loves, please do not forget to like this video. It's a free way that you can help your girl out. And until next time, I love you guys so, so, so very much. And I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye. Love you guys. Bye.